So welcome to chapter 9. We're talking about two sample inference, inferences, confidence intervals, and hypothesis tests. Two sample means that we can start to do something new. We can compare what we've got. We can ask the question, does something work? And does this population affect that population? And the first question we're interested in is, does the data come to us in pairs? Now in paired inference, each measurement matches with another measurement. Now that could be that we performed a before and after study. So for each measurement we performed before, um, there was a measurement performed after. It might be a study of siblings, so for, or twins. And it might be a study of something as simple as left and right arms, where for each one there's a matching other one. Now there's always the same number of measurements in each data set and each measurement is matched or paired. So for each one, there's one that it's connected to, that it's paired with um, in the other list. Now, when we've got data that comes to us in pairs, um, we can treat them as one sample statistics. We just take the differences, and we'll be doing that in section two. Um, because we can reduce anything about paired data to one sample statistics, that takes us back to chapters 7 and 8, this chapter will focus on independent, that is unpaired samples. And in 9.1 we talk about two proportions. We've been talking about proportions first for quite a while. We do that because we can use our z-tests. Now for two populations, we're interested in doing hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. And all of this will be on the difference. In other words, is one population's proportion bigger or smaller or the same as another? So for hypothesis tests for two population proportions, we're going to find that in our calculator with two proportion Z tests. And here we're going to state just how to um, make sure that you've satisfied all the conditions, that you know what the null and al alternative hypotheses are, and how to get those um, results out of your calculator and interpret it correctly. So the first step, as always, is to state the random variables. Here there's two populations, so we're going to make that distinction with two sets of subscript, and two population parameters, p because we're talking about proportions. And again, p sub 1 and p sub 2 for those two population um, proportions. The hypothesis and the level of significance alpha. So we're going to um, always use, for in our class, the null hypothesis is that the two um, population proportions, p1 and p2, are the same. Notice that that's the same as saying, if you do a little algebra, that their difference is zero. And in spoken English, we say that, hey, what's the difference? And if someone says there's no difference, that basically means that they're the same. That's the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis could be that the first population, that is, um, the population denoted with the subscript 1 is has a smaller proportion of successes than the second population. That might simply be that the two populations have different proportions or that the first population has a bigger proportion than the second one. The assumptions are um, a little bit longer than, than sometimes because we've got a uh, we've got to also make a claim about the populations being independent. That's that second one there, B. The first is that we've got simple random samples for both populations. The second one's new, and that's a new usage of the word independent. It's basically saying that we are looking for um, data that doesn't overlap, so two separate populations. So that usage of the word independent is very similar to saying that the two populations are simply different. So two populations are independent. Now we're going to see the word independent again in the binomial conditions. A fixed sample size, two outcomes, and independent. But that that usage of independent for the binomial conditions is basically saying that one trial does not affect the probability in the next. Now, what we now also want to um, point out at this point is that our null hypothesis isn't really giving us any information. It's giving us a tiny amount of information to allow us to simplify one test statistic, and that's it. 
Um, it's not telling us that there is a particular number in the population in general, just that the two population proportions are the same. So we're going to have to use the sample proportions. We're going to have to use the hats, P1 and P2 hat, to um, uh, instead of the population proportions. Now, another thing to point out, and, and we're going to be doing this um, the same way we did last time, and that is that the um, simple way of showing that we've got enough of each, that we've got enough of the um, successes and enough of the failures, is simply to look at that algebraic expression. So looking at the subscript 1, we've got np hat equals n, and then remember p hat is the sample proportion, so x over n, the n's cancel and we're left with um, just x. So that is nice because it allows us to simply say that the number of successes and the number of failures have to be at least 5. Now to find the sample statistic, test statistic, and p-value, we have to have a new idea, and that is the pooled proportion. It's shown not with a hat, but with a bar, and it's defined in a really weird way. It's almost like what addition would be if addition of fractions wasn't as hard as it really is, and you could just add numerators and denominators. So there's p bar, that's the pooled proportion, and of course the complement of p bar is q bar. Um, those numbers then give us z. Now notice that our book has a z value with the difference p1 minus p2 in it. Now we don't need p1 minus p2, we're going to use a z value that doesn't have that term in it because we're assuming that p1 equals p2, so their difference is zero, so they go away. So our z value is going to be using p1 hat and p2 hat, those are the proportions for each of the population separately, and then the pooled proportions from um, just adding the number of successes in the numerator and adding the number of trials in the denominator, and then of course the um, complement. Now we're going to find our p-value with the calculator. We need to know whether it's a left or a right tail test, and we'll do that when we state the alternative hypothesis. The conclusion, as always, if the p-value is less than alpha, we're going to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative, and we'll say that there is sufficient evidence to support the alternative hypothesis. Otherwise, we're going to say that there is not enough evidence to support the alternative hypothesis and then, of course, at that stated um, level of alpha. Um, the interpretation should be said as much as possible in real English so that it's clear what that interpretation means, what your results are telling you. Um, for the confidence interval, steps one and three are the same. Um, we use in our calculator the two proportion z interval, which makes perfect sense. z because we've got proportions. So our confidence interval, as always, is our point estimate plus or minus our margin of error. So that point estimate is what we get from the sample. So in this case, what we've got is the difference of the sample proportions. The difference because we're interested in knowing whether one is bigger than the other, whether that difference is positive, negative, or zero. Um, that point estimate comes from the sample. The margin of error comes from the sample as well, of course, and multiplied by that z value. The z value comes from the table or from Bell. So if you show this in all of its glory, this is telling us that the um, confidence interval to estimate the population difference in proportions. So that's our goal, is to estimate the difference in the population proportions is exactly what you'd expect. It's that point estimate minus the um, margin of error on the lower side, and then on the upper side, the point estimate plus the margin of error. And then, of course, that's bounding the true population proportion difference.
So let's look at an example. Um, cheating husbands, um, something from our book. It says, do more husbands cheat on their wives than wives cheat on their husbands? Um, suppose you take a group of a thousand randomly selected husbands and find that 231 had cheated on their wives. Suppose that in a group of 1,200 randomly selected wives, 176 had cheated on their husbands. Does the data show that the proportion of husbands who cheat on their wives is more than the proportion of wives who cheat on their husbands? And alpha is 0 0.05. So we're going to do this uh, with our calculator. We'll come back to that. But before we do that, let's start this hypothesis test. So the first thing we're doing here, of course, is stating our um, random variable. We've got two populations, so we've got two x's. x sub 1 is the number of men who cheated on their wives in the um, sample, and x sub 2 is the number of women who cheated on their husbands in that sample, that independent sample. We've also got two parameters. We're looking at proportions or percentages. So P sub 1 has to match with the X sub 1. So we're talking about men in both of those first um, samples and populations. P sub 1 is the proportion of men who cheated on their wives in the population in general. And P sub 2 is the proportion of women who cheated on their husbands. So the hypothesis, exactly what you'd expect, the null hypothesis is that the two population proportions, P sub 1 and P sub 2, are equal. The alternative hypothesis came from the wording of the problem. Remember that it asked us if um, the proportion of husbands who cheat on their wives is more than the proportion of wives who cheat on their husbands. So that's what we're asked to check. So when we um, set up the alternative hypothesis, we're checking whether P sub 1, the proportion of men who cheat, is greater than P sub 2, the proportion of women who cheat. And then remember that our alpha is 5%, 0 0.05. The assumptions are that we've got a simple random sample, and we were told that they were randomly selected. Um, definitely, the samples are independent. One is of husbands, and the other is of wives. Um, we've got all the binomial conditions met. There's a fixed number of trials. There's two outcomes. And there's that word independent again. That is one um, uh, spouse choosing to cheat on their um, significant other should not affect whether another um, spouse chooses to cheat. And then, of course, we have to choose that we've got, show that we've got enough of each. That is that we've got at least five successes. And remember, x is counting successes, oddly worded, as the phrase successes usually is in a stat setting. x is counting the number of um, married folks who cheated. So in both cases, we've got at least five. And failures, oddly enough, is the number of married folks in our samples who did not cheat. And in both cases, we've got at least five of um, the successes and five of the failures. There's the arithmetic um, showing you that that works out nicely. Our first task is to find the sample statistics, and that's simply the proportion of each population, wives and husbands who cheated, will be the proportion in our sample of men who cheated. So let's figure out what that is. So we had 231 husbands out of 1,000 who cheated. So our proportion for the first sample, P1 hat, is about 23%. Now let's take a look at our second example for wives. 176 out of 1,200. That gives us very close to 15%. 0.14667 when we round. So there's our um, sample statistics, our hats, that is the um, pro proportion in our sample of, in the first case, men who cheated and women who cheated. You can see that those numbers are significantly different. Now let's take a look at finding the z-score and p-value. If you go into the Chapter 9 applications, the first one is a difference of proportion. Remember, anytime you've got a distribution or statistics in GeoGebra, you can go to other places as well. So here we are in a z-test, a 
difference of proportions. So let's take a look at what this is telling us. We put in the null hypothesis is that the differences are zero, that is to say that they are equal, and that the alternative hypothesis is that P1 is greater than P2. Remember, P1 is the population proportion for men who cheat, and P2 is the population proportion for women who cheat. So our alternative hypothesis, certainly supported by the data in this sample, support that P1 is greater than P2, and you can see that that's selected. We then enter the number of successes. Remember that that is how we say the characteristic that we're interested in tracking, in this case, cheating on one's spouse, ends the total sample size for each of those two samples. That information is then given back to us, and the first thing we see is our Z value. If we think of these in terms of standard deviations, we can see that this is very, very far from the mean in terms of standard deviation, so we're not surprised at all that the p-value is essentially zero. So let's put this data into our workbook. So our conclusion by comparing our p-value to alpha is that our p-value is less than alpha, so we reject the null hypothesis. And we say there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that men cheat on their wives more than women cheat on their husbands. Now, of course, the next part of this is going to be making a confidence interval. So using that same data from those same two samples, we're going to construct a confidence interval at the 95% level of confidence. So steps one and three are the same. Notice that if you've just been following along with the z-test for a difference of proportions, you can go down to the z-estimate for a difference of proportions, and the data will follow along with you. We're interested in a 95% confidence interval, so let's make sure that our data is correct for that. A 95% confidence interval, and here's what we see. So it looks like our lower limit is 0.0514, and our upper limit is 0.1172. So we've got our sample statistics, our p-hats, and we've got our confidence interval. Now, the statistical interpretation of this is that there's a 95% chance that the difference in population proportions is between about 5% and 11%. That contains the true difference in proportions. Now, that's just strangely worded. I mean, it makes perfect sense in our context, but in terms of what that actually means in terms of conveying this in English, I think it's much nicer to say the proportion of husbands who cheat is between, remember that was P sub 1, so when we did that difference we got um, between 5 percentage points and 11 percentage points higher than the percentage of women who cheat on their husbands. And that completes um, chapter 9, section 1, and we'll be back for section 2.